Welcome to my YouTube channel. My guest on Facing the Canon is Trudy Makepeace, author of Abused, Addicted, Free. Trudy, welcome to Facing the Canon. Oh, it's lovely to be with you, J. John. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to have you. Your book, Abused, Addicted, Free. What can I say? Uh, probably one of the most gripping, engaging stories that I've read. And I'm just delighted you can be on the programme to tell us a little bit about this. So where were you born? Uh, I was born in Reading, Royal Barks. You familiar with that? Yes. Yeah, so I was born there. Um, grew up in Berkshire in a little town called Newbury. But your, now, your mum, tell us just a little bit about your mother and uh, how you were conceived. Yes, yeah, sure. So uh, my, my mother was uh, from, from Newbury and um, she, as a teenager, had run off um, to join a hippie convoy in Nottingham when she was about 17, 16, 17. Um, she came back pregnant. Um, yeah, so really. <laughs> and that was you? Yeah, that was me. So yeah, that, that was the beginning of me. So yeah. Um, and l life was quite hard growing up. What happened? Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, um, my mum, she um, had me at 17. Um, I was adopted in the family, so uh, my uncle and my aunt, they adopted me and I discovered at the age of four that I'd been adopted. Um, one of my aunties, you always get somebody in the family that, that kind of opens their mouth probably when they shouldn't and I had one of those in my auntie and um, I just remember her saying to me one time, you know, that your real, uh, your mum is not your real mum and uh, at the age of four that really kind of just... Um, at first, when I heard that news, I, I just went into a bit of shock, and and then I thought, oh, it must be good news that, that I've got a, you know, that I've got two mums. And I remember running into my mum, and my mum just kind of walloping me across the other side of the room. And, and I think at that young age, what I learned w was that there must be something wrong with me. That, um, you know, I learned never to speak about it again. Um, and yeah, just I feel like from that moment on, there was just a fear about speaking out. Um, and just a confusion about who I was. Um, and yeah, I grew up and, you know, my dad was hard working. Um, I was the eldest of five, um, but life was difficult at home. My mum was quite emotionally, physically um, abusive. Um, and from the age of five, I was sexually abused. And that went on into my teenage years. And really that, that was probably the hardest thing because that first happened at the age of five. And once again, that just intensified that sense of something was wrong with me, you know, what's wrong with me, you know, and I just internalised all those feelings, unable to speak about them for the fear of speaking out, um, and just a sense of shame and unworthiness and just, just this belief that I was bad on the inside. And then just from a young child, I just began to almost uh, try to escape my reality through daydreaming in any way that I could because... It was too painful and I didn't know how to process um, all that had gone on and I didn't have an outlet for it. So it was just all internalised. And really from that, from young, I just was running, running, and I never running. stopped running. And then various care homes. Uh... Yeah, lots of different foster parents. Um, and uh, just was, by the time I went into care, I was really, really troubled and uh, just yeah, wanted a better life for myself really and, and thought now I was away from that situation um, that things would be better, you know, because prior to that I'd run away a few times, I tried to take my own life um, and I thought now I'm out of that situation, life would be better, but, but actually it, it didn't get it didn't. better. And how old were you when you wanted to take your own life? Uh, the first time about 12. So you really felt there was nothing to live for here? Yeah, I think, I think probably the first time I tried to take my own life, I probably didn't want to die, but I was desperate. 
I was desperate to escape yes. the, the, the pain and the, tr you know, the, the troubles on the inside. I didn't know how to, to cope with it. And, and I think it was just a desperate attempt to, to yes. alleviate some of that. And then abuse led to addiction yeah. for many years. Tell us about the cycle of addiction. Sure, yeah. So I guess, like, like I said, that running just never stopped. You know, and uh, I guess really when I went into care, I was looking for love and acceptance and belonging, really. And so I quickly got in with the wrong crowd. Um, and I wouldn't have chosen to take drugs, but I suppose at that time as well, I was easily influenced and uh, yeah, turned to and what, taking- And what did you get addicted to? So yeah, all kinds. Started off on amphetamines, was addicted to amphetamines for about five years. They say you're clinically mad after five years of taking amphetamines but then I progressed on to crack cocaine and heroin so 18 years uh, I was addicted for um, and yeah. how and how were you paying for all this uh, stealing you know stealing uh, fraud uh, theft burglaries um, but my main thing probably was stealing um, theft and fraud would be my and then eventually it went on to prostitution so eventually I found myself working in, in brothels and parlours and eventually on the streets. Um, but then your addictive habits were quite costly and expensive. And was there a particular day where you succumbed to prostitution? Because that must have been a very big decision oh, to make. Oh, it was make. massive. It, it was huge. And um, yeah, it, it really was. I think, yeah, you don't really know what you've lost till you've lost it. And I think for me, um, that decision was such a huge decision. That was influenced, I suppose, by certain men in my life at the time and just really struggling. I'd got clean for a little while. Um, I was, um, I'd moved to Bristol and I was just really struggling to stay afloat. And somebody would made a suggestion about working in parlours and I kind of dismissed it. But then my struggle caused me to start looking and thinking about it. And I think that sense, uh, that belief that I had that I, I wasn't worth much really fed into that final decision. I think I didn't really value myself at all. I think if I had a done, I probably would have made a different decision. Yes. Um, but and, uh, yeah. And, uh, and how long did that season last for? Oh my gosh. So I was about 23, so about 10 years. 10 years. Yeah, 10 years. And it started off in, in the parlours and private clients and eventually. I was just so relentless in my addiction um, that, you know, I would be up for weeks at a time, J. John. I would uh, just be relentless and I would be in the brothel uh, in the evening. I'd come out, I'd be on the street corner until goodness knows what time in the day and then I'd be out stealing or doing fraud. And I was just on this relentless treadmill and like day in, day out, day in, day out. Um, I'd really got to a point really where things had escalated so much out of control, I'd say that my addiction possessed me. Yes. My obsession led to a possession. A possession, yeah. Literally. Very evil and dark yeah. and oppressive. And you know, you've heard of men putting women on the street. Well, you know, at the time mine was screaming to get me off the street because I just got to a point where I was just unstoppable. I was living for nothing else. I think I was so broken, so lost. And you know, when you give up hope, it's a really dangerous place to be because then anything goes. I, that's what I like about your subtitle to your book, Abused, Addicted, Free. free. Okay, yeah. tell us how you, <laughs> how you began the yeah. journey of freedom. Yeah. What changed? What changed was I met Jesus. Well, that's what really changed because I had tried 33 times to get clean. J. John. 33, 33 times? 33 times. I had done rehab, I'd done cold turkeys, I'd gone abroad, you name it, I tried it. Over the years, so over those 18 years, it wasn't for the want of trying, but every time I tried to get free, it was almost as if um, it became harder and harder and the more enslaved I became, I just couldn't do it on my own. And so... For so, so you would do one recovery course, but not really get free? Yeah, I suppose what would happen is I would detox, like I would get the substance out of me, um, but I couldn't sustain it and I would just slip back in. So I never really did, I, I went in, I did a few rehabs, but ended up going back as well. So yeah, just couldn't sustain it on my own. It was almost like, yeah, you were clean, but I was still an emptiness 
on the inside. There was still something missing regarding purpose. And yeah, just, it was like I was white knuckling it. Yes. And I couldn't, I didn't have the strength to sustain it. I needed a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of perspective. And I couldn't do that for me. And uh, so what changed for me was um, was meeting Jesus. So, or he met me, should I say. So, and where did that happen? How so, did it happen? Yeah, so I ended up going into a Christian rehab. The first time I went into this Christian rehab, I... Um, I ended up going through um, a project called The Fishes and Lives. It's based in Bristol. There's some nuns that work there. And it was them that first got me into uh, this Christian rehab in South Wales. And uh, it's, an in it's interesting, actually, because while I was there, I, re I remember just um, bef before I got there, I was about five stone. I was living in a squat, um, living on the, the streets in different crack houses. and. And um, I just remember collapsing on their doorstep one day, you know, five stone and, and them just managing to get me into this Christian rehabilitation centre. And I remember going there and I remember thinking, you know, what are these people on? They're on a different planet. They drink tea. They watch the news. It was like so alien from my life because my life was like 250 miles an hour. And uh, yeah, it just seemed so abnormal to me. And I remember being there and there was just something different about these people and, and I couldn't really identify what it was but I, I, I knew that it was spiritual. I ended up running off back to the streets and a few years later um, the nuns again made a way for me to be able to go back and I remember going back and I was taken to a meeting, um, an evangelistic meeting where Reinhard Bonnke yes. was preaching and um, I just remember going in uh, St David's Hall in Cardiff and just from, I'd never seen anything like it, this big building and posh red carpets and all these people and and I was just like, I found it really just like, yeah, like well, where am I? But anyway, we were in there and, you know, uh, this this guy, Reinhard Bonnke, he, he came out, obviously, I know him to be an evangelist Absolutely. now. Absolutely, <laughs> well, I know, but, what a legend. I knew Reinhard, oh, we were friends. Amazing. Amazing man. What a privilege, but, Jay John. But at that time, <laughs> You just, you're there, he's preaching. He's preaching and he just, um, I was just captivated in the moment, but I was still quite, quite chaotic in my, in my mind and didn't really understand what was going on. But as he was preaching and he, you know, was preaching, you know, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And he went on to say about, you know, that God could give us a fresh start and forgive us of our sins. Well, you didn't need to tell me I was a sinner. I knew I was a sinner and I knew that I needed forgiveness. And I don't remember everything about the message that day apart from those things. But I just remember just this desire in my heart to respond when he said to some, you know, was there anybody here that wanted to receive Jesus? And I ran down to the front and received Jesus into my life that day. I just remember going down to the front and I didn't know what it was, but I could feel this heavy, weighty presence, which now I would know was the presence of Jesus. And somebody prayed for me. I felt a heat go through my body. And I just remember walking out of there feeling like I was walking on air, just knew that my life would never be the same again. However, it was a few weeks later that I ran off from the rehab again because of the temptations i know so you had this incredible experience yeah. 2d yeah that you couldn't deny yeah and yet something was pulling you yeah. that's the power of temptation yeah so i'd received jesus i ended up back in prison uh, about a month later. How did you end up going back to prison? Well, basically I had a warrant out for my arrest because I breached my bail. I was back on the streets. I got picked up on the streets um, for working the streets that night. Anyway, um, yeah, basically I was uh, there. I was back in the prison for about three weeks and Victory Outreach contacted me to invite me to come back. Basically, they said, if you want to come back, we'll represent you in court and we'll say we're willing to take you back. And uh, I didn't really want to go back because I thought of all that confinement and yeah, I wanted to be free. Um, but I remember being in my cell and I just, it was almost like um, at the time I wouldn't have known it, but now I know it to be the Holy Spirit. I wanted to go back to my old life, but there was just this something like invisible kind of wall. And it was just like, I just, 
it was really surreal at the time, really surreal. I couldn't have articulated it at the time, but now I would know it's the Holy Spirit. And um, anyway, eventually I made peace with the decision to go back if the court would permit me. So I went back to Victory Outreach um, after the court said, we'll give you six months to prove yourself and then you'll come back for sentencing. I went back to this rehab and I had a second encounter. So I'd been saved. I'd been saved, I've had my sins forgiven. I was now yes. catching up with what God was doing. I was obviously a bit slow in the process, but now I was recognizing that something was different and something was happening. Um, but it was while I was in the, the rehab then that um, somebody gave me a copy of the Father's Love Letter. I don't know if you've ever yes, read it. Yes, powerful. Um, but it's just littered with different Scriptures. Bible verses. Yes. Yeah, through there that talks about God's love and just how much he loves us, you know, how he'd seen it all, and to paraphrase it, how he'd seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, and he loved me, he'd seen me on the street corner, he'd seen me in some of the most dire situations when I had been at my worst, yet he still sent Jesus, he still sent Jesus because he loved me, to, to rescue me, to pull me out of that mess, and to bring me back into a relationship with God the Father. Well, I'd never known my biological father, and I find it so wonderful that Jesus meets us all individually. And for me, in that moment, like as I read that, I felt like I'd come home. As I began to read about God's love and just, you know, what he'd done for me, I, I just felt this sense of coming home, like like just, just this peace and just this sense of coming home and this sense of I found what I've always been looking for but never knew that I was looking. And uh, I remember then uh, just getting to the end of that letter and just praying again to receive Jesus. Yes. But you see, the first time I received Jesus, I don't think I fully understood, you know. Um, like surrender. Yeah, yeah. I think to the extent you understand the truth. Yes. The truth can set you free. But like you said, it's not just the understanding. Yes. But like it was that level of surrender now. I really understood. Yeah. Now I really understood I'd made a mess of things and I needed help. And now I really just said, look, I've got nothing. This is it. You know, I give everything to you. And it was in that place that God really met me. And I would say it was that that was quite radically life transforming that really helped me on the rest of my journey. And they then you and then you went back to the court. Yeah. And what happened there? Yeah, so they, they looked at me and they just said, you know, you and, because I went back and it was the same bench, um, the same three three people on the bench, and they, they looked at me and they just said, you're not the same person. You, you know, we're looking at you and you're not just physically different. We can see that you are not the same person. And I just remember thinking, yeah, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Old things are passed away and become new. You know, when I got saved, J. John, it was like, um, I became a virgin again. Yes. It was like... Um, well, born again. Yeah, like, I w yeah, when I, when I really surrendered to Jesus, like, I didn't just experience love, peace and joy, but like, I just felt like the, w the weight of all the past, all the brokenness was lifted and I felt like so clean on the inside, like I'd had a bath on the inside. It was the most beautiful thing. And so then to stand before... Um, you know, this bench and for them to recognise yeah, like to that difference, it. literally, I was like, look, that you don't even realise like how uh, significant what you're saying is because I really am not the same person. You know, and that's a wonderful thing about Jesus, isn't it? That he will give anybody and everybody a fresh start, you know, if they're willing to trust him and they're willing to hand over and surrender to him and yeah that, that that's it really like from from that moment my life just began to radically change but it did start with that with surrender that. real true surrender yeah. yeah and then you went back and before long you weren't just one of the people there you were on the staff I mean, can you believe it i mean you couldn't make it up jay john no. but i I I, um, I just remember once <laughs> I remember once being sat in the office thinking re feeling really inferior after a few months and I just felt the Lord say you know everything up until this point is, is qualified you for this everything up until this point and it was one of the most privileges uh, it was a really really special time because we used to go into the prisons and um, just share about Jesus bring them home 
and love them back to life and introduce them to Jesus. And it was such a privilege. It's such a blessing. So, yeah. <laughs> and sorry, it was just such an amazing time and just seeing people, you know, be healed, be restored and just be set free. So, yeah, just it was such a privilege. So amazing. You, you had this uh, sense that the Lord was calling you into ministry? Well, I guess I, if you'd have asked me anything, I would have always said I would have been a missionary. Mother Teresa had always been my my kind of person to look up to as a child. Yes. I'd always kind of, if there was anything when I got born again, it would have been to tell people about Jesus and you know, to, to help people in other countries. So I always kind of had that anyway. But yeah, I felt God calling me out. Um, and it, it was beautiful the way that he did it over a period of time and uh, calling me to Bible college. Now, I wasn't really up for Bible college. I didn't have an education. So to have to go and do, you know, uh, Bible college, it wasn't up. It wasn't on my agenda. No, and this is a degree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This so, is serious study. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, but it was amazing. Again, it was a, an incredible time of my life where God just really... Um, strengthened me and increased my capacity really for so much more and a place where um, I feel like my positioning there was um, strategic as well for 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 what what he's purposed ahead but yeah so I, I was there for three years went there at 40 got a degree two one not bad two for one some, not bad for somebody that had no education prior to that that's amazing so it was amazing so then it you was get amazing graduated and yeah, yeah. You, you've got ordained i got ordained and you're over a zoom minister i got ordained over zoom in 2000 and i actually i think i was one of the longer probationary ministers i don't know if god's hand was in that but this usually takes three years i think mine took four and a half years I blame it on the pandemic as well. And now you're a, a pastor evangelist. Yeah. So Tell us about that. Yeah, I think my heart at the moment really, yeah. I mean, obviously I've been doing that. So with Elim, who are, I'm a minister with, yes. it's a requirement to serve in a local church, which has been an incredible blessing, really. And it's been really, really um a wonderful season of my of my life but but my heart really is for revival my heart is for the lost my heart is for the broken and so for me really I am there and I'm functioning in that but really my main focus is reaching those that need to hear the message of Jesus really um, and just to see him be made known to see people encounter freedom healing wholeness and purpose for their lives so that's that's kind of what my heart beats for that, that's what my heart beats for, but I do everything and everything. You know, I don't know if you know local church, <laughs> just like, you know, and um, one of the things I also do there is I, I serve um, uh, the, it, the homeless um, and the addicts because we're in a quite a socially challenging area. So um, as part of what I do, I also uh, minister to those guys as well. Wonderful. Yeah. Judy, what would you say to our viewers those that are abused and still feeling broken and trapped and those that are addicted, what would you say to them? Yeah, I think the first thing I would want to say is that God loves you, that God values you, that God sent Jesus to die on a cross for you so that you could know hope, that you could know healing, that you could know freedom. Um, you know, that he wants to restore you. Um, I think the biggest thing I would want to say is that there is hope in Jesus. There is hope. There is hope no matter what you've been through, no matter what the journey has been to this point, that God is able to restore all things, to work all things together for good to those that would trust him, uh, would trust him with those areas of their lives and I know for myself I'm living proof of that. I'm not saying it's all easy, I'm not saying it's all easy but it takes that first step of, of trust. Um, you know as you take that step towards God, he'll take that step towards you and he is able, he is able to meet you, to walk with you, to restore you, to heal you and to set you free from that, those traumas and just those things that you've been through. And would you pray as well yeah. for anyone 
who's yeah. suffering in that particular manner. Yeah, yeah. Father God, I just thank you. I thank you, God, that you're a God who sees, that you're a God who cares. Lord God, I thank you that your heart, Lord, is for people. I thank you, Father, that you want to bring healing, you want to bring hope, you want to bring restoration to those that have been through different forms of abuse and addiction. And Father God, that was never your plan, that was never your purpose for their lives, Lord God. And Father God, I thank you, Lord, that even when they felt like you've been far away, you've been closer than they think. And Father God, I thank you that you sent Jesus, that you sent Jesus to, to die on a cross, Lord God, for our healing, for our healing, Lord God. And I just pray right now for, for healing and freedom, Lord God, for those that have experienced great trauma, great, great abuse in their lives, Lord God. Father, I just... I pray for healing. I just break off the lies of them that they are unworthy, that they're not good enough, that, that it's, it's their fault somehow, Lord God. Yeah, I just break off those lies of the enemy in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father God, I just declare and decree your love over them. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just bring a revelation of the Father's love and the Father's heart for them. Lord, that you would draw them to yourself, Lord God. I thank you, God, that your heart, Lord God, is to restore them that you are the great restorer, you are the great healer. And I thank you, Father. I thank you for what you've done in my life in so many people's lives. And I pray, Lord, for those watching that maybe don't know you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that they would take that step towards you, Lord God. And Lord, when they do, Lord, that they would just encounter your embrace, Lord. And as they surrender to you, Lord, that they would, that they too, Lord, just would go on the greatest adventure of their life of discovering the hope and the freedom that is found in you. I pray your protection over them. I pray your blessing upon them in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Trudy. Your name, Trudy, <laughs> make peace. You love it. Well, you've made <laughs> peace with God and uh, you certainly carry uh, the peace of the Lord in your life and it really does exude from you uh, Trudy you're a very beautiful woman inside and out it's um, it's been a joy to have you on facing the canon thank you for thank joining you us. so much Jay John Wow how inspiring is that well abused addicted free get the book give it away, give it to people um, who need to be free. And I hope that's encouraged you and inspired you that if God can do it in someone like Trudy, he can do it in anyone. Thank you so much for joining us on Facing the Canon. Please join us again.